Good evening, everyone, and, and, and welcome to the 2017 American Academy in Berlin New York Gala. It's uh, wonderful to have you all here in this beautiful room uh, at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, I would like to thank Marina Kellen French for making this possible, and I would also like to say thank you to the new president of the Met who's with us tonight and is with Marina, uh, Dan Weiss and his wife. Uh, I, I'm not here to welcome you, but I thank you for welcoming us uh, to, to this beautiful... Uh uh, tonight, we are uh, very lucky to, uh, to have uh, three experts with us that are going to talk to us tonight. Um, it feels as though the U.S.-German relationship and the U.S.-European relationship uh, are once again at the forefront of, of, of our conversations. And no one is, has a deeper or a more organic understanding of that relationship and the dynamics of it than Dr. Henry Kissinger. And I would, um, for, he was my first boss uh, in 1973, and so I go way back with him. We actually visited the temple together in Egypt um, uh, that many years ago. Um, but for the past 20 years, he has served as our founding chairman along with Richard Holbrook, and we have all all of the trustees and I have been uh, extremely grateful for his steadfast leadership and guidance for the work of the Academy. So uh, we're, we're delighted to, that he has agreed to engage tonight in a conversation about the future of the U.S.-German relationship and, and the world at large. I'm, I'm also very pleased that his companion, his steadfast companion of 43 years, his wife Nancy, could join us tonight. And so welcome to both of you. And thank you, Nancy, for loaning up him to us for all uh, of these years. Um, uh, I want to also express my appreciation to the other participants of tonight's uh, program, Matthias Doppner and Tom Friedman. Matthias is the chief executive officer of Axel Springer and also serves as a trustee of the American Academy. Matthias has taken a traditional print media company and stewarded Springer Verlag into the new digital era with great success. He has made it the largest digital publishing company in Europe. And along the way, he has written extensively on the pluses and the perils of the new age for both individuals and businesses. So we will hear from Matthias later in the evening. New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Tom Friedman joins us tonight. He has been a distinguished visitor at the Academy several times. He has always spoken to sold out crowds. Um, and his most recent book, Thank You for Being Late, is a fascinating take on the world we are living in, in a hyper pace. And so we are grateful very much, Tom, to you for moderating the two conversations that we'll be having this evening. The first one with Henry on the future of the global order and then during dessert with Matthias on the future of the digital world order. I'd also like to welcome Tom's wife, Ann Friedman, who's with us tonight. I don't know, Ann, if you have been to the Academy in Berlin, but Anne is a force in her own right and is opening a Museum of Language Arts in Washington, D.C. So I'm not sure when we can go visit the museum, but we will all find out from Anne later. Uh, we have many distinguished guests in the audience tonight, but I wanted to single out a few for special acknowledgement. 
Christoph Huysken and his wife, Ina, have been longtime friends of the American Academy, especially in Christoph's role as National Security Advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel. We are delighted that she has appointed him as ambassador to as Germany's permanent representative at the United Nations, which also means that even though he will be far away from the Academy in Berlin, he will still be close to all of his friends here in New York and our friends here in New York. So Christoph, welcome to you and Ina to New York. And we look forward to working you from, with you from this side of the Atlantic. I would also like to welcome Consul General David Gill. David, I'm not sure where you are because I didn't see, you. there you are, there you are. Um, David is also newly arrived uh, from Germany uh, uh, with his wife Cynthia and uh, uh, we're delighted that you're here and we look forward also to working with you from New York instead of from Berlin. Um, the American Academy was the idea of our founder, the late Richard Holbrook. <laughs> Richard was the U.S. ambassador to Germany when the U.S. Army left Berlin in 1994. A student of history, Richard understood the importance of the moment and felt strongly that a permanent U.S. institution should be left in the Army's place. But not just any institution, he conceived of an academy that would focus on promoting cultural and intellectual exchanges to help provide the foundation that could hold together the more complicated political and economic relationships. Our American fellows who spend an entire semester in research in Berlin are artists, historians, economists, musicologists, legal scholars, archeologists, anthropologists, linguists, and journalists from all across the United States. Their ability to engage the Berlin community on their topics of expertise has generated a rich exchange of ideas for two decades. This semester, the Academy has engaged the Berlin community on subjects that run the gamut from barriers to integration, running after Dubois, black musicians in the land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, the post-war collapse of work for American men, and populism and the pursuit of dignity. At the same time, the Holbrook Forum has sponsored two symposiums this semester, one on diplomacy in the Balkans and the other, the Digital Diplomacy Project, which explores power, innovation, and order in a networked world. We are fortunate to have several of our former fellows with us this evening. Neuroscientist David Popel is here, columnist Richard Cohen is here, musicologist Mark Pottinger, architect Asra Akhan, novelist Nathan Englander, historian Alex Novikov, author and journalist George Packer, artist Sarah Morris, and last but not least, our president Michael Steinberg was also a fellow in 2003, a musicologist. And uh, we're also graced tonight by the presence of several people who have come to the Academy as distinguished visitors. Sir James Wolfenson is here, Jules Pfeiffer, Steve Ratner, Ambassador Frank Wisner, and Roger Cohen. They're all sprinkled amongst you tonight, as are all of our trustees, so I encourage you all to, to know one another if, if you don't already. Uh, the American Academy is um, fortunate to have so many supporters. Um, you're all here because you have supported the Academy. Uh, the Board of Trustees and I are deeply grateful to, uh, to your support. Um, a lot of you have been here since we were a startup 20 years ago. Um, and 
Richard Holbrook left us 15 years into our 20-year journey. Uh, but I know that even then, he felt that we had achieved the correct combination of programming to be a meaningful and sustained voice in the U.S.-German landscape. And that is what we have set out to do. None of this would have been possible without the active involvement of my fellow trustees, who I am very grateful to. There are so many of them here tonight, I'm not going to name them all, but you will meet them at your different tables. But this is, I do want to say an especially uh, warm sense of thanks and uh, to the Kellen Arnhold family who have continued for 20 years to be the primary supporters of the Academy. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude for their vision, guidance, and generosity. A lot is talked about in this country about philanthropy and, uh, and the Kellen Arnhold family are, are shining examples of philanthropy at its, at its incredibly best. We are joined tonight by Michael and Denise Kellen, Marina Kellen French, Nina von Maltzen, and Andrew Gundlach. And uh, I just want to say an especially uh, warm thank you to, to them. Um, Michael Steinberg and I are also very grateful to have the wise counsel of two men who are the vice chairman of the American Academy, Gerhard Casper and Manfred Bischoff. They have uh, stewarded us very well and stewarded me very well over the years, and I'm deeply grateful to both of you as well. Um, as the chairperson of the Academy, I, this has, uh, the Academy has been, a, a, I guess, a labor of love. Um, it was sort of an unexpected labor of love, but anyway, it, it has become a, a labor of love. Um, and one of the bonuses is all of the very interesting people and talented people I have come in contact with through, through the Academy. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, what a treat to be here this evening. Gail, thank you so much for uh, giving me the honor to be here with Henry Kissinger and, and, and Matthias. Um, I'm a twice fellow of the American Academy, and so uh, I know all too well how valuable it is. You know, I, I told Henry coming up here that um, I could take all 22 minutes and 42 seconds just to introduce him, and he said, um, why not? Um, so, uh, but I think we'll give it a pass. Um, Henry, it's a treat to be with you here this evening, uh, and I, I want to dive right in. Um, I think we're at a time in America right now when, um, for a lot of reasons, people are really uh, desperate for navigation. Uh, navigation about the big trends in the world today and how America should be winding its way through them. I understand the Cold War world. I understand the post-Cold War world. But this post-post-Cold War world has me really vexed. Give me your definition of the main gears and pulleys of this post-post-Cold War world we're in right now? I think the unique aspect of the, of the world now is that there are a number of upheavals going on in different parts of the world following different principles. Hmm. With not attempting to achieve similar objectives. And that, at the same time, there is a need to create some order and coherence within regions, but equally some order of coherence between the regions. And overlaying it all, as a technology whose characteristics are extremely elusive even for the experts, which will change our perception of reality and in fact create its own reality. Uh, 
That is, I think, the overriding challenge of our period at a time when in most countries the leadership comes out of a political process which is geared to the solution of immediate issues and leaves little space for a reflection about the future. The way technology basically is got everybody uh, tweeting and reacting and in the moment it makes it very difficult to think in any kind of long-term framework. Well, and even technology, technologies creating world-changing technologies without understanding their historical implication. Is it a uniquely difficult time um, to be Secretary of State in any administration right now, given the fact that, if I think back of, of your era, a, a lot of what you had to do was manage strength, our strength, the strength of the Soviet Union, the strength of a rising China. It feels today that so much of being Secretary of State is managing weakness, uh, a, a weaker Russia, um, states falling apart, literally, uh, and in some ways maybe even a weaker America, at least relative to the world. Well, in the period in which I was Secretary of State, foreign policy was conducted by states hmm. and some ideologies, but even the ideological states like Russia were operating by principles that had been more or less established in the European system hundreds of years earlier. That is, they were based on the proposition that there were some unique characteristics, but that there had to, there had to be some sort of a relationship. But right now, uh, Europe is not playing its traditional role. It is not supplying ideas mm -hmm. and leadership. Uh, America, America is groping for a definition. China has put forward a concept of, of world order that is compatible with its own history and which represents an application of the Mackinder concept of geopolitics in which Eurasia becomes, it's redesigned, but it's not a military concept. It's a concept of cultural and economic Dominate. Uh, super, superiority and, and a, a kind of, of hegemony. In the Middle East, the European system that was put in in 1919 has disintegrated. So there are three or four revolutions going on simultaneously within countries, between countries, between ethnic groups, uh, and so to define or to develop a concept of order, it's very difficult. And for America, our challenge is that through the greatest part of our history, we have not had to deal with the problem of grand strategy. We were relatively secure we could deal with, pro with problems pragmatically as they arose. But in the world that I'm sketching, the, the, it's, for, it cannot be solved with solutions to individual problems. These solutions have to be built into a process in which changes of relative nuance gradually spread and we have little experience with that. We have done tremendous things in the post-war world in designing one pattern for the Atlantic relationship that happened to be relevant to the dominant problems of the period. And we need a canon concept, mm. it's something that explains to us what, what we are supposed to do over an indefinite period of time, which is rare 
in the American experience, but that is our challenge. And all of these events are impacting on each other. Henry, you've, you've had a, a remarkable diplomatic and academic career. As you look back on it, who are the one or two or three most intriguing statesmen or stateswomen that you interacted with over these years? Well, you, you have to ask a statesman whether he understands the deeper challenge of its period hmm. and whether he has a sense of, of direction and the courage to go on the road which initially cannot have total support or it would have been taken. Hmm. Uh, but so when you ask me about people uh, that I found significant, uh, I was impressed by Adenauer. Adenauer. Yes, Why? Because, because at a moment of, des of a desperate uh, of, uh, fall for Germany, he had the courage to assert a democratic uh, solution and building Germany into an international system and being willing to accept the division of his own country and to cooperate in the division of his country mm. uh, with a belief that this would create a, a sense of reality out of which Europe could gradually re rediscover itself. So he was not, it did not impact immediately on America, mm. but based on my experience in Germany, mm and my study of history, for a German statesman to have the courage to come out of the war with a conviction that a democratic Germany could be created out of this chaotic situation that existed there, that was a, uh, a, a heroic measure. I, uh, uh, this seems strange because I was not very much involved in African policy, but, uh, but I met Mandela after he had been released from uh, uh, jail. And I was tremendously moved by the fact that with all the suffering he had uh, experienced, uh, he was so committed to uh, integrating his society, and by chance, uh, while he was in prison, he had read about shuttle diplomacy. This is how I met him. Huh. So it had become a symbol to him, uh, and so he asked to meet me when he came here, and, and I was very much moved in my various, by his generosity of spirit. Mm. Uh, it's not been as possible to carry out uh, the the attitude, and uh, on, on the other side, I was impressed by Joe and Lai. Joe and Lai. I was impressed because the life that they had led was of course country to my convictions. But they had, but he, when I encountered him, his assignment was to create a new relationship with the United States. And we had not talked to each other for 25 years. And on my secret trip to China, where I had 48 hours to accomplish what needed to be accomplished, which was really 
the only thing that could be accomplished was to establish enough confidence mm. that we could accomplish something. Mm. So, and in, if you read these conversations, which are now available, they sound like two university professors discussing the future evolution. And the reason that was important was because over the foreseeable future, we would interact with each other and impinge on each other, uh, the two societies. And we had to begin to learn how we thought about problems. So, um, If I were to think of the most dangerous hot spots in the world today, Henry, the number one would be the North Korea, the Korean Peninsula. But number two, I would put actually Iran and Israel. Because I think that between Iran and Israel today, because of the dysfunction of those states in the middle, is really just butter. And you feel the Iranians pushing, pushing west. Um, obviously, the Israelis are looking out at them. It doesn't feel like we particularly have figured out what role we want to play there. The Russians are in the Syrian theater. How should we understand Iranian foreign policy today? And what do you think would be the most effective way to deal with it? Well, on the Iran-Israel issue, uh, <clears throat> in the days I was in office, there was no clash between yeah. Iran and sure. Israel because Iran thought of itself as a state and uh, Israel was a state. And so uh, relations were really re reasonably good. But now that Iran has become a dual state, on the one hand, it, it, it's based on European concepts of sovereignty and it participates in the UN and so forth. But on the other hand, it, on the other side, it is also conducting a, a, revolution. a missionary revolution and, uh, and, it's, and it's not following the principles of of the state system, and insofar as it conducts its leadership of a of a of a re revolution, it is a direct threat to the survival of Israel. And it's announced that. So then, that creates for Israel the necessity, and for uh, uh, Iran the temptation of of using its, its missionary capacity to set up the various subgroups that exist in Lebanon Proxies, and in Yemen yeah. and so forth. And for Israel, the imminence of a, of a clash. And so in the Middle East, separate from the Iran-Israel problem, there is the need of establishing a balance between the Shia and the Sunni uh, 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 groupings, so long as those become the def remain the defining characteristics yes. uh, of 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 the region, and for outside countries to participate in this, they have so many considerations uh, 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 to make. But I think the immediate problem is to create a limit to Iranian expansionism. Mm. And that expansionism is facilitated by the disintegration of the states yes. in between yeah. Iran and, 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 and the coast. Uh, so that is a, a big conceptual yes. problem and a big technical uh, uh, problem. When you look at the other regional power there, Saudi Arabia, um, trying to now project power out to balance Iran in the absence of an American balancer. How do you analyze their dilemma? Well, Saudi Arabia is a feudal state that unexpectedly acquired enormous resources with which it could participate in international politics, but only up to a certain limit, only to the limit of what it could uh, achieve with financial contributions. Internally, it is a classical feudal state in which loyalty 
is on the basis of the personal relationship of the group leader to the various subordinate groups. Right. It has now undertaken a one-day revolution in which it tries to move from a feudal state to a uh, legitimate, in quotation marks, yes. European or Western uh, type state, and you participate simultaneously in the operation of the state system, such as it is in the region. That is a monumental task of holding together both its domestic structure and being effective in, uh, internationally. So, uh, insofar as the United States plays a role, we have to have some concept of what we mean by order in the region and what we need to con uh, contribute to it. And we also have to understand the scope of action of the, uh, of the various states uh, because uh, there is a danger of, of getting drawn into conflict suits dimension. Yes. We cannot, we, we cannot manage. What should we know about the structural relationship between a secretary of state and their president um, that makes them effective? I'm just asking, you know. Uh. No, I, I, I have seen that in, in 10 administrations. And one has to begin by saying it depends, on, importantly, on the personalities. Mm -hmm. How does the secretary, how does the president conceive his role? Yes. Because he is the uh, key uh, element. How, do, how do, does he conceive of policy? Uh, but one, I would say, one principle is absolute. That the Secretary of State must have the absolute confidence of the President. That the idea that you can set up two power centers in, and that the Secretary of State can conduct an alternate policy for the, for the president is not, is not possible. What, the, what tends to fall to the president is the overall design of the global strategy. What falls to the secretary of state is the day-to-day -day management of this with uh, uh, 195 or so uh, sovereign states. Uh, so, unless this can be, it worked extremely well with Schultz and Reagan, with Baker uh, Bush. and Bush, mm -hmm. and with Nixon and me. Yeah. Uh, it does not work well when people encourage clashes or when you think of the Secretary of State. Yes. As an alternate, it doesn't work at all if the Secretary of State doesn't understand the nature of the global challenge that he faces. How do you, um, how do you look at Israel's dilemma these days? It, how do I? Look at Israel's dilemma these days, because it almost seems like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is off the table. Um, the, um, basically, the weakening of the Arab states around it has diminish that pressure on Israel, uh, yet the demographic uh, destiny is still playing out there. It's surrounded, as you alluded to in your intro, Henry, uh, by non-state actors on the Gaza border, the Lebanon border, the Sinai border. How do you diagnose their strategic challenge today? It's a pure strategic challenge. It is frightening because this is a small state with six million people around which a group of, of countries that declare themselves hostile is evolving uh, while technology produces weapons of such destructiveness and which need so little personal ability to operate. Uh, uh, so, 
it is a new problem in the sense. I hold the view, which I know most of you probably do not hold, I do not believe it is possible to make a final agreement. And I think that to call an agreement final guarantees that it cannot be executed mm -hmm. because that I, I deeply believe that there should be agreements. Yes. But I think Israel and the Arab world progresses better through a series of agreements that progressively improve their situation, but which they do not have to declare as the ultimate end because the Muslims cannot accept it uh, for religious reasons and the Israelis will have difficulty accepting it because it's too constraining. Uh, so I believe there, there should be negotiations I think ingenuity should be concentrated on a series of measures that can be taken by which people live together without having to declare the permanence uh, of this. But this is a minority view. Mm -hmm. I did not know it would come up here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that it's more likely that we would talk about China than about Israel. So I, for those of you who are offended by this... Too uh, bad. We say it's okay. It's <laughs> Not in the least. Well, let, let's uh, talk about it. Before we close, Henry, a couple things. One is um, Germany uh, going through a really difficult political process right now. Such an anchor to Europe. Um, what worries you about the German situation right now? I think Germany is historically in a very, in the unusual situation that in its national history, it has not often had a normal existence with its neighbors. Uh, in its national history, that is since 18, 71, partly because of the complexity of the geography, uh, partly because of the late unification, uh, uh, but partly because it has found itself uh, either a, as a, a victim of circumstance or as an attempt to, dom to dominate it. So. So to find a place for itself in the Adenauer world, that is, in, in which Germany is a component of a European system and a contributor to the European system on the basis of the equality of states, uh, it, this is an unusually hmm. uh, difficult uh, task. And now Germany is going through a period where it has become conscious of its uh, enormous uh, strength, but it's also uh, pressured by the circumstances that are, that are taking place uh, around it. Uh, I think we should all hope that in Germany a stable government can emerge out of the present crisis and that Germany can make a, the contribution which it alone can make to the cohesion, but to do it in an atmosphere in which one can avoid the national clashes. Uh, that is the big challenge for the next phase in Germany, and it's important that the United States and Germany cooperate, and this is why the American Academy and the efforts and the mood that is attempted to be created and is created there, it's such an important event for, uh, for the future, uh, for the future evolution. And having seen this for a 
participated in it in one way or another in all my life. This is a dramatic, dangerous, but potentially uplifting moment. So before we close, let's make the last stop in Beijing. Um, we just had the Party Congress. Uh, President Hu, unlike his immediate predecessors, did not name a clear successor. Um, should we be assured by that, unnerved by that? How do we understand his presidency right now? Well, as I said at the beginning, the key challenge is that all the regions of the world have to come to some view of what the evolution is going to be. And here is China. For it had, has never had the concept of sovereign equality in its, in its evolution. It has had a different cultural background uh, uh, than Europe. For China, the world was hierarchical in which various countries were classified as tributaries of the central kingdom and, and in which foreign policy was based on respect, not on le legitimacy. Hmm. Uh, as a veteran of the Vietnam period, I asked Deng Xiaoping once what he thought, to, what he was trying to accomplish by invading Vietnam. And he said, I wanted to teach them respect. Hmm. Western statesmen hmm. would not put it this way. So now China is in a position that is unique in its history because on the one hand, it can foresee a technology and an econ world economy in which it will become very eminent, but not necessarily preeminent. How does one coexist in a world in one did not have to practice that, that virtue? Hmm. And so when they look at America, there are two possibilities. One, that America asks the same question, and the other, that America may do what they might do, which is to hold them, if they to hold them down. So, they are now, I think Xi, strangely, in, would look for a way of co-evolution with the United States. Uh, but the Chinese think in long terms. Hmm. So the challenge for America is we think primarily in pragmatic terms. We think in terms of the solution of specific immediate problems. So what preoccupies me and should preoccupy people is, is it possible to have a dialogue on the issue of two states emerging into potential preeminence yes. and managing their relationship in such a way, not necessarily that they run the world together, but that they conduct themselves in such a way that they do not exacerbate and mitigate. Uh, now that sounds very abstract, but I think that is it's the key of the challenge uh, that China poses and that makes both these relationships an internal problem in both countries because there are elements in China who think that we are on the way down hmm. and that their task is simply, and there are elements in the United States who think that this is an irrevocable conflict and we must prepare ourselves to conducting it. And if both of these, or even one of these, prevails, hmm. then a conflict will occur and will have worse yes. consequences than World War I because 
modern technology is of such an abstractness uh, that it will prove essentially unmanageable in a war between great powers. That is the great challenge, to my mind, mm. of, of uh, and the obstacles in both countries. And, and that then will affect because India and all the countries affected that are, also have to define a direction for themselves. Uh, so this is what the real China problem, in my opinion, is and goes to the heart of our perception of the world and of our ability to to manage to manage the world. You know, Henry, when um, when you retire one day, is there a, a story you'll look back on an encounter you had with the world leader? that you'll say, that was my favorite. Is there one story, one encounter, you met all these amazing leaders throughout history. Is there one that, when you retire, you'll look back on? Events that were moving to me, but they may not have, they were not of global significance. Uh, and one will seem not relevant to you at all. Uh, the Vietnam negotiations. Uh, my closest partner was Winston Lord, and he was my closest partner because he had wanted to leave during the Cambodian experiences, and I told him, if you stay here, you can achieve something other than walking around with a placard. And when the Vietnamese accepted our proposal, I shook hands with Winston and said, we've done it. I tell you the story of a failure because it didn't turn out that we had done it because our domestic situation didn't yeah. enable us to yeah. uh, to sustain it. And another moving moment that was, I was negotiating with us with Sadat in Aswan, and an aide brought in a piece of paper, and he read it, and got up and walked over to me, and kissed me on both cheeks. Sadat and said, Sadat, and said they have just signed the disengagement agreement along the Suez Canal. Bro. I will take off my uniform today and will never wear it again except on symbolic occasions, huh. which of course he did yeah. when he was. So that was for me a very moving moment. I'm, there were more significant conversations. But since this is an unexpected question, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> unprepared and we those those and definitely so I those felt at the moment that I described. Absolutely. Henry, thank you so much. It's a treat to be in this conversation with you. Thank you very much. Um, Matthias, before we get into uh, big data and bots and algorithms, um, I wondered if we could just pick up where, where Henry left off. Um, give us, this is about you know, the American Academy in Berlin, give us your frank uh, assessment of where German politics is today and what we can expect. Um, because uh, watching from this side of the ocean, we're seeing things just as you looking at us and seeing things you've never seen before. Um, uh, we're a little bit looking at you now and seeing things we've never seen before. Explain it to me. What's going on in German politics right now? Tom, thank you. You're so kind to start with the easy questions. <laughs> um, well, I think basically what is happening it is 
an election campaign that was a one-topic campaign. It was all about refugees and the consequences of this influx of refugees in Germany and what that does to the German society. And Can I just stop you right there just to take 30 seconds? What does it do? Because what's been the social impact of it? Well, there's a very, very aggressive discomfort of uh, people that, um, on the one hand, they want to be very open-minded mm -hmm. and want to help people that are really in trouble, coming right. from war zones. Uh, that is clearly one thing. On the other hand, they don't understand why they are waiting for five years for a new apartment, right. and it is offered immediately to a new immigrant to refugees. Yeah. And uh, there is this element of, of jealousy, but it's more than that. It's also the fear that that could undermine uh, German values, that there are double standards with regard to legal uh, systems. Uh, if you have trials where uh, the judge says, well, we have to understand it because it is related to a different uh, culture where um, uh, murder uh, of, of a family member for honor reasons right. is culturally acceptable, then this is not understood by, by the German public. However, it's very emotional. It's uh, moving the, the party political systems to its extremes. It strengthens mm -hmm. the extremes. The AfD, on the one hand, that is taking advantage of certain right. resentments. And that is all leading to a lot of instability, has weakened the big parties, and has led to these huge losses of the CDU. Uh, mainly, of course, this uh, is an issue of the CDU, but also the Social Democrats suffered a great deal. And now there is this very um, kind of difficult situation where the pre-talks of coalition uh, negotiations led to a fact that the Liberal Democrats uh, just had the impression that they, that, they, that they will play a very minor role oh. in that new government, that, it is, uh, that there were too many points given to the Greens uh, by the Conservative Party, and they left. It was big criticism, this is uh, illoyal, it's lack of patriotism and so on. It's strange. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you pre-negotiate because you want to find out whether there is common ground. Right. And there was not enough common ground, so the Liberal Dems left, mm. and now everything is possible. Uh, ranging from uh, a minority uh, government would then be most likely a Liberal Democrat conservative government, uh, or uh, another grand coalition, or new elections. So for those in the audience who aren't familiar with uh, Axel Springer's uh, platform, Tell us, what, what's the range of media outlets you, you own and, and are sitting on top of right now? Well, Axel Springer was founded after the Second World War. It used to be a newspaper and magazine publisher. Uh, it is today uh, mainly driven by digital publishing uh, and uh, digital marketplaces, classifieds, job, real estate, cars, like the, the, the classified ads in the newspaper. That is a very important part of our business today. And digital brands like Politico Europe, like Business Insider here in the US, mm. We invested in Nine Media, a digital media company here in the United States. We have launched new brands like Update in cooperation with Samsung. Mm -hmm. uh, so today, uh, roughly uh, two thirds of our revenues and uh, three quarters of our profits are coming from digital businesses. So what is it like to be a digital publisher in the age of Facebook? Um, you know, we at the New York Times uh, learned the hard way that Facebook wanted all of our readers, it wanted all of our advertisers, and it wanted none of our editors. Uh, well, uh, they prefer actually bots and um, AI, because editor is a human being you have to pay. And we discovered in the last election the downside of that. So w what's it like for you? Well, first of all, because I really get into the details of the Facebook uh, mm -hmm. uh, challenge, looking at the temple of Isis uh, and Osiris, uh, it reminds me a bit of, of, of our situation. You see, yeah. the, the, the carvings in stone, they, they seem to be outdated. On the other hand, you could say they are the emojis of the ancient right. Egyptians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in a way, I think, uh, I think a great story remains a great story remains right. a great story, and uh, journalism is not going to die. The challenge is just uh, since let's say, um, uh, the passing away of uh, newspapers on paper takes longer than expected, but it's happening. Mm. So the only question is, are we able to emancipate the idea of a newspaper from paper? Mm. So that is the only future of journalism 
yes. th that, it, that there is a sustainable, healthy business model for digital journalism. And here Facebook comes in. Facebook pretends to be a technology company that is connecting people. That is the vision of Mark Zuckerberg. And we, um, uh, we, should, uh, we should remind him of that vision because at the moment it looks a little different. Facebook is the company that has worldwide the best model to monetize journalism. Yes. They have zero content creation costs because they take the content of other people, but they get almost 100% of advertising money. Yes. 99% of advertising growth in the fourth quarter of last year in America was. went to Google and Facebook, 99%. Mm. 1% was shared by the publishers. And that is, of course, a model that looks very good from a Facebook perspective. Right. Yeah, that's why they have just announced 4.7 billion profits in the ninth quarter of, of this year. Uh, and they are super strong economically. On the other hand, they are facing I think they're really at a, at a crossroad. Yes. And they are in a very crucial situation because they are facing totally unexpected and new challenges that are mainly driven by the debate around fake news. Yes. People are realizing that it is so easy to distribute false news through a social distribution platform like, like Facebook, and they see also which consequences yes. that has. If we look uh, to the influence that Russian sources had on the American election campaign, or uh, other examples where... And did you see the same thing in the German election campaign? Well, not to that degree, right. but of course there were a lot of uh, efforts to, sure. to influence and to ma manipulate that, absolutely. And in a way, you could say that is now um, a potential game changer because uh, the idea that a trustful source, that a reliable journalistic brand is really working hard in order to find out the truth, and right. if they are making mistakes, they apologize and they explain, that plays a different role. And that leads to new dynamics with regard to Facebook. Either they, in a way, reduce themselves to the role of a really neutral right. technical distribution platform yeah. that helps publishers to establish a successful business model. And there are signals in that direction. They are announcing that they are going to prepare subscription uh, tools. Or they will be seen as a publisher. And if Facebook is a publisher with 2 billion readers worldwide yes. out of 3.5 billion internet yeah. users worldwide, this is a world monopoly. And that monopoly is going to be broken up. I think sooner or later. Wow. Um, I don't think I I'm not that. saying that that is happening. I think yeah. Mark is too smart to uh, allow that. That's why I'm more optimistic that the role is going to change and that it is going to lead to a more healthier ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, what's the um, what's exciting you now? Me? Well, of course I'm. Uh, I'm very excited by the possibilities of artificial intelligence, also particularly for our industry. And, and exactly why? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, there's this debate, is, is artificial intelligence good or bad, or is it really going to solve the problems? That reminds me a bit of the story of a, uh, a company, uh, a tech company that is preparing the launch of a new, very sophisticated artificial intelligence product, a robot. And the developer of the robot is presenting the new product to the CEO of the company, prou proudly, of course. And uh, the CEO says, OK, I'm, I, we are ready to launch, but let me test the product. So I'm asking the robot some questions. So my first question is, what is my brother doing at this moment? So the robot immediately answers, uh, your brother is uh, sitting on an American airline plane 507 mm -hmm. from New York to Beijing. CEO is impressed and says, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So now I have a tougher question. What is, what is my father actually doing at this moment? Robert answers, your father uh, is sitting at the beach at the Rockaways and fish is fishing. Mm. So the CEO says, ha, I got you. Mm. That's wrong. Mm. My father passed away many years. So the Robert says, sorry, that is the husband of your mother. Your father is sitting at the Rockaways and fishing. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, <laughs> I think the evidence is that artificial intelligence is working and also these 
this debates that artificial intelligence has no emotion and that's why it is uh, inferior to human intelligence. I think it is an outdated debate among artificial intelligence experts because of course artificial intelligence can simulate emotions and has emotions. So that is all a given. Um, I think that in the long run, I truly believe that there are much more opportunities. I mean, for us as a publisher, for example, we are already using robots to write stories, and they are writing great stories. For mm. example, about soccer matches of the third league and the second league, we could never afford mm. to publish these stories because it's too costly, but a robot can really yeah. do it. It's data-driven journalism, right, yeah. and the articles, you will be surprised, it's a good read. Yes. Uh, uh, but, uh, so that is, yeah. How, how long before they do opinion columns? Well, that's a tough call. Uh, <laughs> Investigative reporting and-, and I'm and, 64, and so it's- yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, be prepared, there will be some competition. Yes. It is amazing. I mean, these robots can all, you, you, can, you can program it and they, they, can, they can write stories in very different styles. Yeah, interesting. So they could do uh, uh, New York Times uh, uh, style. Uh, I mean, of course, not yeah. up to the standards of Tom Friedman, but uh, <laughs> to a certain degree, they can simulate that. Yeah. Fascinating. No, it is fascinating. But I mean, there are also some, there are also some more uh, serious uh, issues in that debate. Of course, the thing that really excites me is to which degree are we able to manage the fact that the machine is serving mankind and not the other way around. That is the crucial yes. question. There are other people who are worried about it, like Elon Musk, who has raised yes. this billion dollar fund in order to make sure that there is enough competition. And I think that is the yes. crucial point. If artificial intelligence is in the hands of very few big corporations, it's a threat. And then this whole idea of singularity is a, is a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, but if there is truly competition among various players, I think it is uh, so serving great things to, to, to our civilization. And there is more upside than downside. And it's also, in the long run, I think, going to create more jobs than it's destroying jobs. Um, I, I would agree with you. We may go back to that. You know, we're, we're at a really strange moment in America now where, uh, in my view at least, the, the real opposition party in America on um, uh, an issue like climate, for instance, is actually the state of California. Um, so, uh, because California has real artillery, it has, it has market power. Um, and at the same time, the opposition uh, party in America on privacy, in many ways, is the European Union. Uh, right. And the issues uh, that it has uh, put forth uh, in your courts toward uh, Google finding Google last year, um, uh, two billion dollars, I think, and, and putting pressure on uh, the um, insisting that um, I can uh, I can be forgotten. Um, that if I stole hubcabs when I was in high school, you know, um, that I don't have to live with that as part of my Google profile forever. Mm -hmm. Talk about that uh, a little bit, and, and uh, will Europe be able to continue to hold out, and in a sense be America's regulator at a time when? Uh, Silicon Valley is able to mm. basically buy off anyone in Congress now that they want. Not well, that they would, but I mean, just yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, it's just a yeah. matter of speech, yeah. right? Yeah. So, first of all, I, I, I just like to to, to avoid that 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 that. that, that, that did you get the impression that I'm obsessed about Google? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the reason why I wrote this letter to, to Eric Schmidt that led to this huge wave of discussion was simply because I talked a couple of years ago with so many big business leaders of big international corporations, and they were all talking behind the scenes about Google and said, well, we are, they, they are so powerful, we cannot dare to speak up. You know? And I asked, well, why, don't, why don't you say it publicly? Yeah. They said, we, we cannot do that. That is harming our business too yeah. much. We are, we are depending on them. Mm. So I couldn't believe that. And I thought, we are so small, we can right. afford to speak up. So that's why I wrote that letter. Well, tell, people a, little bit, tell people a little bit about the letter. Well, it was just, uh, I just described in an open letter to Eric Schmidt the, 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 the threats of Google and how they are abusing their market dominating position and what that does to right. the ecosystem of, of, of digital economy and particularly of publishing. And that led to a surprising international debate, yeah. then to a, 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 a cartel uh, case in Brussels and then to this, uh, uh, step by step to this 2.4 billion fine, what did which is not relevant that? because of the money. Right. It is relevant because it's going to change the behavior of uh, Google because they cannot uh, afford 
to continue to abuse their market dominating yes. position with self-referential search. So for example, if there's a competitor who comes up with a product that is in a certain competition right. with Google products, they were able in the past to just downgrade right. it and put it on rank 30, although it was perhaps the market leading yeah. traffic generator. Mm. And they, they cannot do that. And it has also implications on various uh, fields of, 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 of the industry. You, you mentioned in your question, I think that in a way that issue, I wouldn't say that it's solved, but I think it has a disciplining effect, right. and that is appreciated by so many American mm -hmm. corporations, you wouldn't believe it's how many corporations were applauding discreetly behind the scenes, ah. and we're happy that that happened. Yeah. Uh, it's not against Google, it's just pro-competition, it's pro-level playing field, and diversity of innovations that cannot be just uh, done by one or two big uh, corporations, that's not healthy. The other uh, aspect that you have mentioned, data, I think that is perhaps the even more interesting thing if we compare Europe with America. Um, because here we have a very different mentality right. on both th sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. And where does that come from? I think it has to do with the two most important traumas of the two uh, uh, countries. In, uh, in Europe, the biggest trauma is the Holocaust. And the lesson that Europeans learned from the Holocaust is that total transparency leads to totalitarianism, mm -hmm. and that particularly the Nazis built a system based on total transparency, on uh, espionage against their own people, knowing everything, knowing who is gay, knowing who is Jewish, knowing who is a communist, and knowing where to find them, put them into the concentration camp, and even put a tattoo with a number on the arms of uh, the uh, victims. Mm. So that is the, the historic trauma of Europe. The trauma of the United States is probably 9-11, mm. and what to do to prevent terrorism. Mm. And in the name of terror prevention, you need as much transparency as possible. So transparency and access to data is a positive in America, right. in Europe, it's a negative. We know where that can lead to. Now I think, as so often, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Europeans tend to be over skeptical and have sometimes an understanding of privacy and data protection that is just anti-business and unrealistic. On the other hand, the idea that there is no limit and this idea, and it was a quote, sometimes it's uh, um, attributed to Eric Schmidt, sometimes it's attributed to Mark Zuckerberg, I think both said similar things like, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. I think that's a terrible sentence. Yeah, it's a sentence that could be said by the secret service of a dictatorship. It's not a sentence that belongs to a free open society to democracy. And that's why we have to define certain limits and why we have to make sure that there are rules to whom the data belong and what can be done with the data, who has access to the data, how long the data are stored, and so on and so on. There are huge issues and I think they are far from being just business issues, they are social issues, they are very political issues and they are essential for democracy. What is your China market like? Do you do business in China? Actually, that's such an interesting question. We, we, are, we are going to travel to China uh, in a couple um, of weeks because we think it is so inspiring and so um, extremely interesting what is happening there. At the same time, we have a corporate policy that we do not invest in non-democratic countries. Interesting. China is clearly not a democracy. By the way, we have that rule not only for ethic reasons. We also have it because we made so many bad experiences in non-democratic systems because you may make wonderful gains in the short term, in the long run you're going to pay a high price because you either, lose, either you, you lose your morale and your compliance standards or uh, you lose your business. Yeah. However, um, we don't do business uh, in China, um, but to see with the dynamism of, yeah. of the Chinese players like Alibaba and Tencent and to see also this mix of, I mean, a kind of autocratic 
capitalism yes. that is so much more efficient and has no yeah. limitations. And speaking about data, what China does, I mean, they have full access to everything. Yes. They not only have access to the data, they even uh, have uh, systems to see what people are typing into their, uh, into their uh, keyboards. They have a system of points. If you live in an apartment that is too big, you get negative points yeah. and so on and so on. So it's a full surveillance uh, capitalism. Uh, in that sense, it's also an interesting learning experience what you may not want to copy in our democracies. Um, we got just a couple minutes left, uh, Matthias. What, what, what's really exciting you now? Wishing you were 20 years. Well, what is exciting me is, of course, that I think the likelihood that journalism is going to survive and is going to be a real good business model is getting higher and higher every month. I think the fake news debate mm. was the best PR campaign exactly. for branded content. Uh, the fact that Google and Facebook are implementing subscription tools may be a game changer. Yes. The fact that we generate with a brand like Business Insider more than 50% revenue growth this year is just very encouraging. So I think That's just the, the prospects of a journalistic uh, business model uh, are getting better. And then, as I said, the, the, the possibilities of artificial intelligence to improve not only journalism, but really to improve society, to improve labor markets, I find extremely interesting that the whole um, uh, industry is completely shifting to mobile uh, is good. I have always been a mobile user. I just, I just um, uh, threw, threw away my laptop on my uh, office desk. I'm, I'm a mobile only user now. I think that then the whole uh, possibilities through voice uh, uh, applications are exciting. I think the whole digitization is the most exciting thing and to be in the middle of it, to see the benefits of it, to embrace it, to shape uh, the future of that, uh, what a privilege. So that excites me. You know, I, I actually was working on a column tomorrow because I just came from India and was stunned to find out that India's Adhar platform, its unique biometric ID platform, now has almost 1.2 billion Indians registered on it, which makes it uh, the, the first public digital platform um, to hit a billion um, ever, and did it faster than uh, Google um, uh, and um, WhatsApp uh, and Facebook. And um, then you go to China and you discover that they've got a completely, uh, they're moving to a completely cashless society. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, where you can now get stuff out of vending machines with your facial recognition. And you kind of look around here and you arrive at Penn Station and it feels like the escalators were invented before suitcases, you know. And um, uh, what to close, what do we look like to you? today, Matthias. We means... Uh, we America. You America? The American side of the American Academy in Berlin. Yeah. What is, honestly, what do we look like? I have to give you a boring answer. I, I think uh, America has not changed. Uh, there is a um, relatively dysfunctional American government. Uh, there was a very uh, bizarre election happening influenced by various factors, internal psychologies, external mm -hmm. propaganda and uh, manipulation. Uh, but I think the, the mentality of the American people mm -hmm. has not changed. There was always a big gap between, let's say, Midwestern Americans and New Yorkers or Californians. Uh, it is a country of diversity, but it is still, for me, the lighthouse of freedom and democracy, and it will survive uh, some little accidents with regards to government building. Yeah. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a singular honor and pleasure for me to greet you as the president of the American Academy in Berlin, uh, as a longtime devotee of the American Academy, starting almost 15 years ago when I was the Anna Maria Kellen Fellow uh, in Berlin in the fall of 2003. 
Um, I'd like to begin very brief remarks by thanking all of our participants, obviously beginning uh, with the panelists that we've heard from uh, now twice, uh, and continuing with uh, all of the contributors that made uh, this evening the success that it is, uh, I would like, with her permission, to single out uh, my very cherished colleague, Gail Hodges-Burt, uh, the chair of the board, who has led a team really not only putting this evening together, not only putting this evening together, but really uh, continuing uh, the generous soul of the, American, uh, of the American Academy. I would also like, uh, once again this evening, uh, to express uh, enormous gratitude to the many generations of the Kellen Arnhold family who have turned the microcosm of the Arnhold Villa into a real beacon of U.S.-German uh, relations, transatlantic relations, and transatlantic relations in the new era of shared global responsibility. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we hear consistently from both the United States and Germany that the mission and work of the American Academy are now more important than ever. We work uniquely and significantly beyond our scale to promote and sustain transatlantic dialogue and values and U.S.-German relations. To our German interlocutors, we bring an America defined by quality, credibility, and sustainability in diverse areas of political, intellectual, and artistic life. To our U.S.-based fellows and our distinguished visitors, we offer convening power with key figures and institutions in Berlin, a city that really remains unrivaled for its assets, its generosity, and its opportunities. Uh, for the young in Berlin, and you know how many young people there are in Berlin, I've heard Berlin referred to as the new Brooklyn, and I think there's uh, some accuracy to that. Also, in, in the increasing prices of real estate, I should say. This year, in particular, we offer a series of events examining the international wave of populism and nationalism, both in Berlin and in April 2018 in New York. Please join us on April 5th at the New School for Social Research for a collaborative inauguration of a series of what we're calling American Academy Alumni Seminars planned for various U.S. locations. We also focus on the interface of digitalization, diplomacy, and globalization, paying attention to the disruption in the field and the so-called dark web, as well as to the benevolent web of global communities. In the humanities and social sciences, we have identified three themes to inform our thinking over the coming years. These themes are migration and integration, race and comparative perspective, and exile and return. The books you will find on the tables and in the Great Hall are yours to take with you as modest bridges between this evening and the life of the American Academy. Please cross that bridge often Please join us in Berlin as our at our planned events in the United States and by helping to ensure the future of this unique and treasured institution. And thank you so very much for being here tonight. Thank you.